weasel, with wonderful celerity uprising, and magnifying as it rose, till it turned, and then there were plainly revealed two long crooked rows of white, glistening teeth, floating up from the undiscoverable bottom. It was Moby Dick's open mouth and scrolled jaw, his vast, shadowed bulk still half blending with the blue of the sea. The glittering mouth yawned beneath the boat like an open door marble tomb, and giving one side long sweep with his steering oar, a had world the craft aside from this tremendous apparition. Then, calling upon Fed Allah to change places with him, went forward to the bowels, and seizing Perth's harpoon, commanded his crew to grasp their oars and stand by to stern. Now, by reason of this timely spinning round the boat upon its axis, its bow, by anticipation, was made to face the whale's head while yet under water. But as if perceiving this stratagem, Moby Dick, with that malicious intelligence ascribed to him, sidelingly transplanted himself, as it were, in an instant, shooting his bleated head lengthwise beneath the boat. Through and through, through every plank and each rib, it thrilled for an instant, the whale obliquely lying on his back, in the manner of a biting shark, slowly and feelingly taking its bowels full within his mouth, so that the long, narrow, scrolled lower jaw curled high up into the open air, and one of the teeth caught in a rowlock. The bluish pearl white of the inside of the jaw was within six inches of Ahab's head, and reached higher than that. In this attitude the white whale now shook the slight cedar as a mildly cruel cat her mouse. With unastonished eyes fed all our gaze, and crossed his arms. But the tiger yellow crew were tumbling over each other's heads to gain the uttermost stern. And now, while both elastic gunnels were springing in and out, as the whale dallied with the doomed craft in this devilish way, and from his body being submerged beneath the boat, he could not be darted ahead from the bows, for the bows were almost inside of him, as it were, and while the other boats involuntarily paused, as before a quick crisis impossible to withstand, then it was that monomaniac Ahab, furious with this tantalizing vicinity of his foe, which placed him all alive and helpless in the very jaws he hated, Frenzied with all this, he seized a long bone with his naked hands, and wildly strove to wrench it from its gripe. As now he thus vainly strove, the jaw slipped from him, the frail gunnels bent in, collapsed, and snapped, as both jaws, like an enormous shears, sliding further aft, bit the craft completely in twain, and locked themselves fast again in the sea, midway between the two floating wrecks. These floated aside, the broken ends drooping, the crew at the stern wreck clinging to the gunnels, and striving to hold fast to the urge to lash them across. At that prelude and moment, ere the boat was yet snapped, Ahab, the first to perceive the whale's intent, by the crafty upraising of his head, a movement that loosed his hold for the time, at that moment his hand had made one final effort to push the boat out of the bite, but only slipping further into the whale's mouth, and tilting over sideways as it slipped, the boat had shaken off his hold on the jaw, spilled him out of it, as he leaned to the push, and so he fell flat face upon the sea. Ripplingly withdrawing from his prey, Moby Dick now lay at a little distance, vertically thrusting his oblong white head up and down in the billows, and at the same time slowly revolving his whole spindled body, so that when his vast wrinkled forehead rose, some twenty or more feet out of the water, the now rising swells, with all their confluent waves, dazzlingly broke against it, vindictively tossing their shivered spray still higher into the air, asterisk so, in a gale, the but half baffled channel billows only recoil from the base of the eddy stone, triumphantly to overleap its summit with their scud. This motion is peculiar to the sperm whale. It receives its designation, pitch holing, from its being likened to that preliminary up and down poise of the whale lands, in the exercise called pitch holing, previously described. By this motion the whale must best and most comprehensively view whatever objects may be encircling him. But soon resuming his horizontal attitude, Moby Dick swam swiftly round and round the wrecked crew, sideways churning the water in his vengeful wake, 
as if lashing himself up to still another and more deadly assault. The sight of the splintered boat seemed to madden him, as the blood of grapes and mulberries cast before Antiochus' elephants in the Book of Maccabees. Meanwhile Ahab half smothered in the foam of the whale's insolent tail, and too much of a cripple to swim. Though he could still keep afloat, even in the heart of such a whirlpool as that, helpless Ahab's head was seen, like a toss bubble which the least chance shock might burst. From the boat's fragmentary stern, fed all and curiously and mildly eyed him. The clinging crew, at the other drifting end, could not succor him. More than enough was it for them to look to themselves. For so revolvingly appalling was the white whale's aspect, and so planetarily swift the ever-contracting circles he made, that he seemed horizontally swooping upon them. And though the other boats, unharmed, still hovered hard by, still they dared not pull into the eddy to strike, lest that should be the signal for the instant destruction of the jeopardized castaways, Ahab and all, nor in that case could they themselves hope to escape. With straining eyes, then, they remained on the outer edge of the direful zone, whose center had now become the old man's head. Meantime, from the beginning all this had been described from the ship's mastheads, and squaring her yards, she had borne down upon the scene, and was now so nigh, that Ahab in the water hailed her. Sail on thee, but that moment a breaking sea dashed on him from Moby Dick, and whelmed him for the time. But struggling out of it again, and chancing to rise on a towering crest, he shouted, Sail on the whale! Drive him off! The Pequod's prows were pointed, and breaking up the charmed circle, she effectually parted the white whale from his victim. As he sullenly swam off, the boats flew to the rescue. Dragged into Stubbaby's boat with bloodshot, blinded eyes, the white brine caking in his wrinkles, the long tension of Ahab's bodily strength did crack, and helplessly he yielded to his body's doom. For a time, lying all crushed in the bottom of Stubby's boat, like one trodden under foot of herds of elephants. Far inland, nameless whales came from him, as desolate sounds from out ravines. But this intensity of his physical prostration did but so much the more abbreviate it. In an instant's compass, great hearts sometimes condensed to one deep pang, the sum total of those shallow pains kindly diffused through feebler men's whole lives. And so, such hearts, though summary in each one suffering, still, if the gods decree it, in their lifetime aggregate a whole age of woe, wholly made up of instantaneous intensities, for even in their pointless centers, those noble natures contain the entire circumferences of inferior souls. The harpoon, said to have, halfway rising, and draggingly leaning on one bended arm, is it safe? Aye, sir for it was not darted. This is it, said Stubb, showing it. Lay it before me. Any missing men? One, two, three, four, five. There were five oars, sir, and here are five men. That's good, dot dash dash help me, man. I wish to stand. So, so, I see him. There, there, going to the leeward still. What a leaping spout! Hands off from me! The eternal sap runs up in Ahab's bones again. Set the sail, outdoors, the helm. It is often the case that when a boat is stove, its crew, being picked up by another boat, help to work that second boat, and the chase is thus continued with what is called double-banked oars. It was thus now, but the added power of the boat did not equal the added power of the whale for he seemed to have treble banked his every fin, swimming with a velocity which plainly showed, that if now, under these circumstances, push on, the chase would prove an indefinitely prolonged, if not a hopeless one, nor could any crew endure for so long a period, such an unintermitted, intense straining at the oar, a thing barely tolerable only in some one brief vicissitude. The ship itself, then, as it sometimes happens, offered the most promising intermediate means of 